Uh, good morning, Wellington. Uh, it's good to be here. Uh, first time I got an earthquake warning. That was, that's different. Um, want to talk about uh, ops to DevOps. And something that we sort of talk about in the DevOps space is this idea that there's this well-worn path to DevOps, right? Everyone thinks like, okay, the CTO's got to show up with two iPads, drop them on the server room floor, and say, we're switching to DevOps. Some people think you've got to go and rewrite your org chart, and you've got to make people sit together, because we all know, you know the open space floor plan has worked out wonderfully for everyone. But the truth of the matter is, some of those things are true in some orgs. A lot of times they're not true in other orgs. Everyone's DevOps transformation is going to look a little bit different. Your transformation is going to be different than your transformation, which is going to be different from your transformation. So what I'm going to talk about today is just some of the things that we did at Centro to sort of kickstart DevOps thinking and DevOps processes. Your mileage may vary. I can't tell you exactly what DevOps looks like, but I can tell you what it doesn't look like. So hopefully, uh, some of these tips are helpful. Oh, did my clicker die? There we go. Ha -ha. So when we talk about DevOps, most people are always like, yes, give me the tools, right? I need the Jenkins and the CI, CD and the Dockers. Uh, and truth be told, the tools are an important part. I don't want to downplay the tools. But most of you probably already know that tools aren't your problem. Technology is seldom the problem in our field, right? The actual problem is usually these two assholes, <laughs> right? Dev and ops locked in this constant struggle, features versus stability, access versus security. And until we like address that struggle, you're never, ever, 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 ever going to actually get DevOps implemented, no matter what tools you adopt. So I have a friend that reached out to me and said, Jeff, I heard you're kind of miserable at your job. And I was like, eh, miserable is kind of a strong word, but accurate. <laughs> and he says, we've got a perfect job for you. We're hiring a DevOps manager. I said, really? DevOps manager? OK, well, tell me about the role. You can imagine what a DevOps manager role job posting looks like, right? All of the you know, fancy buzzwords and whatnot, but when you really look at it, you're like, it just sounds like a manager, right? That, like, there's nothing really DevOpsy about this. So what are we talking about? So I met with the uh, hiring manager. I did the interview process. I'd worked with everyone on the team before except for one guy. Surprisingly, he left two months later, but we won't talk about that. Um, so it was sort of a shoe, and it was just a matter of, is it going to fit? So I chatted with the hiring manager. He sends the offer letter. Look it over. And I say, all right, let me talk with my wife about it, make sure everything's good. Call him back and I say, you know, looks good, but I have to make a counteroffer. Well, of course, you know, naturally, there, we've got some money to play with, Jeff. Whoa, 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 we're not talking about money. I have one very strict requirement that is an absolute deal breaker. He's like, oh, okay, what is it? I said, well, I will only take the job if we change the job title. Hi, everybody, my name is Jeff Smith. You can probably tell I'm not from around here. <laughs> I, I come from the US. Uh, I work for a company called Centro based out of Chicago. I'm the director of production operations, not DevOps. Uh, my Twitter handle is at Dark and Nerdy. If you guys are on the Twitterverse, you can see my handle in the bottom left corner. Uh, feel free to email me, jeff.smith at central.net. And uh, I have a blog that I never update, allthingsdork.com. Uh, feel free to check out some posts from 2008. <laughs> uh, uh, who is Centro? Centro is a company that you've never heard of, but we're doing the Lord's work. We're trying to keep the internet free. Uh, we are an advertising company. Uh, we originally was a, were a media services company, so back when people didn't think the internet was going to catch on, uh, they would outsource their business to us to manage their internet spend. Last two years, they're like, you know, this thing might be around for a little bit. Uh, they're starting to pull that advertising in-house. And now we're saying, well, maybe we'll just sell you the software that we use to manage your ads as a subscription service. So we've turned into more of a SaaS platform. Uh, our tech stack is pretty generic, Ruby on Rails, Postgres. We're in AWS now. Uh, we use Datadog, uh, Stackstorm. How many people have heard of Stackstorm? 
Oh, wow, I got to do more work. Okay. Um, Terraform and Salt Stack. We're going to talk about Stackstorm in an open space, apparently. Uh, just a quick show of hands. How many people identify themselves on the dev side of the house? How many people on the op side? <laughs> How many people in security? <laughs> yeah. Sorry, guy. <laughs> Typical breakdown, though. Um, so, story time, funny story. Um, so, you've got two departments. My wife works at a company. They have two groups, process engineering, software engineering. If you're a new hire, and I said to you, listen, you need to work with a team to identify a process for the new tool that's being developed, what group do you think would help create that process? If you guess process engineering, that would make perfect sense, but you would be wrong. It's software engineering. Process engineering really focuses on augmenting existing processes. Software engineering, well, they think their job is just software engineering, right? They're like, well, there's a process engineering team. Why would I develop a process for a tool that I'm writing? So what ends up happening? No one is accountable for that piece. And I'm telling this story mainly because it's a perfect example of how language is so incredibly impactful in what we do how we think about things, and how we assign responsibilities to people. So when they said, we're hiring for a DevOps manager role, the reason I said, well, we absolutely have to change this job title. Because if I'm the DevOps manager, whose responsibility is DevOps? <laughs> of course it's mine. It instantly becomes this third silo. And that is so antithetical to what we're trying to do here in the DevOps movement. Now, you can have a third silo that sits between dev and ops. How many people have one of those? DevOps team. Don't lie, it's okay. Yeah, all right. Yeah, you know, it's not really productive, right? Because now you've got a third person that you have to sort of keep in the loop. And even if you have a development team that sort of spins up and decides that they want to run ops-related stuff, you know, that lasts for a few weeks until rolling out security patches is boring, and they don't want to do that work anymore. And the system starts to atrophy. So it's very important that when we think about all the things that we do, that we're also thinking about the language that we're using and how it's impacting us. And if you ever want to think about like just how useful that third silo is, think about inviting your mother-in-law into an argument between you and your partner. How, many has, how does that ever work out? It doesn't work out, right? So today what we're going to talk about is we're going to identify and correct what went wrong, expand the scope of operations, talk about behavioral changes, and then different things to monitor to make sure that your transformation is on track. So what was wrong at Centro? If you just, <laughs> if you do this deep, deep process called asking to people, you'd be amazed at the information you get. If you just talk to people, just get outside your bubble and ask, like, what are the things that are blocking you? What are the things that go wrong? What are the things that frustrate you? What are the things that annoy you to come to work? Those things bubble up quickly. So just having conversations is always the first step. And it doesn't take a genius to do this. So within the first couple weeks, I quickly surmised that we had this paternalistic operations view, right? Where we were basically ops was the only person that was mentally capable of managing systems, right? We treated everyone like children in a way. Some of the things that we did, developers, had no rights on their dev instances, period. Your developer, you need to restart a service on your dev instance, call ops, because you might screw it up. Maybe you should hire different devs. Developers had no access to production. And again, when we say access, we're talking about language, right? Because access, when I say access, what are the first things people think of? Shell access, right? They're thinking people are logging into boxes. Well, access can have a very broad definition doesn't necessarily mean people logging into machines. It just means being able to see, manipulate, and observe production. But maybe you can do that in a safe way. And the third thing was developers couldn't create alerts. We always talk about devs need to be on call for their things, right? But how can they be on call if they can't be alerted when things go wrong? It doesn't make any sense for them to have to go through operations to build an alert, especially when they get it wrong and they've got to iterate on it. How many times in ops have you built an alert that was incorrect and you had to tune it? Could you imagine if you had to do a change control request every time you wanted to tune an alert? 
what would you do? You'd be like, well, I just won't alert. It's easier that way. It's less painful. When we talk about these things, people freak out, right? And when we're freaking out, we're usually talking about fear of three things, right? A loss of security, a loss of control, and a loss of approval. Some people call this change management. But if you've done change management, you know that it's largely risk theater, right? You're, you're, you're submitting an approval to a board that has no idea what you do, right? And then they're just coming back and asking you if it's okay. <laughs> so it's like, well, that was really useful, right? Like, hey, boss, I think we should do this change. Really? Let's send it up to the board so they can come back and ask you. <laughs> okay. See you in a few days. <laughs> So there's that trade-off, right? But at the same time, what are we getting in exchange for that trade-off, right? We're getting time back. Ops doesn't have to be dealing with all of these sort of petty requests. We're talking about flexibility. How many times has someone had to postpone a deployment because the person that could do the deploy was unavailable at 8 p.m., right? It's ridiculous. Why do we have to constrain this to one small group or subset of groups? And then interruptions. Interruptions are the best, right? Like, hey, I know you're deep in thought in the middle of something, but can you restart RabbitMQ and then just dive back into whatever problem you were working on for the last four hours, right? It's great for productivity. So one of the things we did was we said, all right, how can we go about correcting these things? And a lot of them were simple and obvious, but they required work. They required effort. Developers get root access to their dev instances. It's a no-brainer. Here's your dev instance. But what's the first thing my team said? Well, then they're going to screw the environment up, and they're going to call me, and I'm going to have to spend time fixing their environment. Fine. You know how we solve that? Give them access to destroy their environment and recreate it. Now that we have like cloud APIs, these are trivial things to do. There's a lot of tools that are out there that will help you do it. So the rule was, hey, guys, carte blanche. You have full access to your environment. If it screws up, though, destroy it and recreate it. It's that simple. That eliminated so many requests for us because now they had the ability to manage their own system. But not only that, it gave them insight into the system in a way that they've never had before, because they pretty much have only seen the world from the view of their laptop. But to see it on a deployed instance and to be able to manipulate that themselves was extremely powerful. Developers get, common, get access to common safe tasks, emphasis on safe. So an interesting thing that we do in ops is we say, oh, we don't trust you to do that action. It's like, oh, so you're infallible? You can't make mistakes? How many people have accidentally taken down a production system because they forgot a flag or something like that, right? I deleted an entire WordPress site once. Turns out it was named Test WordPress, and it got promoted to production, <laughs> like you do. <laughs> so no one was really mad. I was like, see, words matter. Um, but getting them access to common safe tasks eliminated a lot of work on our part again. But not only that, as operations people, we could adopt those processes and use them ourselves, right? Let's dog food it, because guess what? You can make a mistake just as easy as a dev. You can be sleep deprived just as easy as a dev. So if you create tools that manipulate services in safe ways, why not give the access out? Third thing we did, and this one costs money, so your mileage varies, we migrated to Datadog. And the reason we migrated to Datadog was because Datadog allowed us to combine logs, metrics, visualizations, and alerting into a single tool. So now we could say, guess what, devs? Here's all the data about your application, and you can create your own alert for it. You are now responsible for making sure that your system is performing the way it needs to. You no longer have to rely on ops. You figure out what your KPIs are. We will help you, but you can own that. And it gives them a sense of ownership because now they've actually got insight into what's working and what's not. Now they can create an alert. And amazingly, they're doing it. <laughs> because guess what? They don't want to create crap software. They're constrained by the environment that we've created for them. Another thing we did was we started sharing information about the infrastructure. For so long, you know, it was kind of like, oh, you know, you don't really need to know about prod. Why not? That's where the software runs. We need to share this information. We, we did it through lunch and learns. People bring their own lunch. We have a discussion on a topic. We let people suggest the topic, and then we talk about it. 
We did documentation. And don't give me that shit about infrastructure as code being self-documenting, right? Because it's not. We all know that, okay? So if you're like, oh, well, you want to know about the infrastructure, here's a 20-gig repository. Have at it. It's not, a, it's not helpful. Now, I know that infrastructure changes rapidly, but there still should be some sort of like design considerations, some sort of mental model of how this behaves, and that's the thing that you can document. Why is the structure the way it is? Why do we have separate sidekick workers, and why are the queues broken down in a particular fashion? Those are the things that don't change regardless of the shape of the infrastructure. Oh, okay, I thought that was my watch. I was like, oh, that's weird. Uh, and pairing. Sometimes when you're doing some infrastructure changes, you can invite a person over and say, hey, I know you're interested in this. Let's pair together. Let's work on it together. Cool, exciting, fun stuff. So expanding the scope of ops, that was the next thing that we did. So even in my current job title, I'm the director of production operations. But what does production mean? We, have a, uh, we, we train clients. We bring them in and we train them on their software. And uh, we have an entire training department. If the training environment goes down, is that production? I bet the training people would say it is. Staging environments. We've got entire teams that are doing performance testing in the staging environment all day, every day. If that goes down, is that production? I got a bunch of QA people that say it is. CI, CD. If the build pipeline is broken and people can't deploy code, is that production? Sounds like it, right? Production is a perspective. It's not an environment. And we have to get out of this mindset that production is just where the customer is because the customer is multifaceted. The customer is internal. The customer is external. The customer is the person sitting next to you. The customer is the person in your remote office in Denver. So we have to start thinking about expanding what we consider the scope of operations. So the first thing we did was we said we need to start pushing our expertise of production all the way down the pipeline. So um, staging was managed by a different group. So naturally, it looked exactly like production. <laughs> you're laughing because it's true, right? You know, deep down inside, you're like, God, yeah. <laughs> this is so true, right? So the first thing we said is like, sorry, guys, you're out of a job because we're going to start taking over staging. And they're like, thank you. <laughs> thank you so much. We're like two versions behind on Postgres. Um, so we started moving our code base all the way through the pipeline. And when we rewrote configuration management and infrastructure management code, we said we are going to use the same code to build every environment. Right? And that sounds like trivial. It sounds like, oh, yeah, we already know that. But so many people just don't actually do it. So many people are like, oh, well, we'll maintain the separate code base. And then Bob will call us when he changes his production code base. Yeah, OK. Then we moved into dev environments, the local the, the um, smaller instances that developers use. We're going to manage that. CI environments, CI, CD. We said we're taking over the build pipeline. Why? Because only operations has the requisite knowledge to know what production looks like and to ensure that it looks the same all the way down. When we talk about quality, right, one of the reasons I hate QA teams in a way, when we talk about quality, we always talk about it in ways that Treat it like a condiment, right? It's like you have to bake quality into the product through the entire process. You never go order a sandwich and say, can I get some lettuce, some tomato, and some quality? Can you? No, extra quality. Give me some extra quality. Yeah, that looks delicious, right? You don't do that. The quality has to be in all of the ingredients all the way through. And it's the same thing with your environments. Bake quality in from the beginning. And where you can contribute that from an ops perspective is ensuring that your devs are using the same thing that's in production and that it's well maintained. Because even if your devs have a local environment that they've got set up, oh yeah, we wrote Docker scripts for all our stuff, guess what? It's not maintained, right? No, I, someone does that for a two week project and then they leave it. It's a, just a dumpster fire somewhere. And it's not until someone releases code and they're using a new version or a new feature in Postgres that doesn't exist in production that everything blows up. And then you go, oh, wow. You guys are really super advanced. So when we talk about like, what is the scope of operations, I think about the uh, sort of business definition of, of, of operations, right? And it is uh, operations management refers to the administrative, administration of business practices 
To create the highest level of efficiency possible within an organization, it is concerned with converting materials and labor into goods and services as efficiently as possible to maximize the profit of an organization. That's what we call business operations, right? So I'm like, I like that. Well, let's transform it for technical operations, right? How do we transform the, the purpose and the goal of production operations or tech ops? So we started with this definition. Operations management refers to the administration of business technologies to create high level, the highest level of efficiencies possible within an organization. It is concerned with developing systems and processes to help deliver services as efficiently as possible. Systems and processes. Let's get outside the box. We, <laughs> we had uh, someone that was maintaining training environment data. Every time they did a training, we said, well, what does your process look like? And she says, well, every training, I go in and I re-enter these 1,500 records. It takes me about two weeks. And I just look there, and I'm like, what? what? <laughs> you do this manually every training? They're like, yeah. I'm like, well, what happens if we get successful? I don't know. It's a bad place to be, right? Could you imagine having that constraint? Well, we're hiring, we're, we're assigning plenty of clients, we just can't train them fast enough. So we stepped out of outside of our typical production operations persona and we said, well, let's figure out what we can do. And you know what it solved it for her? A backup. We said, configure the database the way you need it with the app and we'll take a backup. And then when you need it, we'll restore it. And then we'll automate it and give you that to do. And we were gods to them. We were literal gods. They're like, oh my goodness. We can fire like six people now. <laughs> they can do valuable work. It was just a matter of having a conversation. So sometimes you gotta step outside the business or outside of the tech arena and also look where you can add value. And that's where the business really starts to see the value of DevOps, right? Because truth be told, a lot of organizations, depending on where they're at, you know, marketing doesn't care that you deploy six times a day. They don't. Uh, offering operational expertise. Don't assume that devs know the best way to run your software in production. When I was coming up through the ranks, I just assumed that every developer knew everything I knew plus more. I had imposter syndrome, well, I still have imposter syndrome, but I'm, I assumed, right, like, oh, well, when you, you know, because I took a non-traditional route through school, right, so I didn't go back to school until I was in my mid to late 20s. And I just naturally assumed that when you went to college, they just infused all this stuff right in the back of your brain batter, right? It was just, it was just there. Um, then, lo and behold, I, I meet someone that doesn't understand networking, and I'm like, but you're a programmer. And they're like, yes, which has very little to do with networking. <laughs> so that's when we said, you know what, guys, we need to make sure that we're offering our operational expertise to people. This is our wheelhouse. We're operations engineers. It's our specialty. We're not really any different than software engineers. The difference is we have a very specific focus. We have a very specific specialization. Not only that, but when you do that, it creates empathy. Because it's very easy for us to sit back and say, oh my God, you didn't know about this OWASP top 10 security vulnerability? It's like, well, people have different specializations. The same way that, you know, you don't know your script sucks. <laughs> right? <laughs> you know, a dev looks at your screen and they're like, oh my God, <laughs> this is what you've been working with? Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Um, so yeah, so offer that operational expertise, create a, a safe space for them to be able to come and ask you questions, create a standard um, uh, interface process so that they know, hey, when we've got problems or questions, this is how we know to uh, engage. So behavioral changes, we talked about uh, words, words matter, words mean stuff. Um, and we instituted a few small changes that, that really helped sort of uh, kickstart things. So how am I doing on time? Okay, good. Sorry, this thing says I've been going for an hour and I'm pretty sure that's wrong. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so behavior can impact performance and how people uh, react. Uh, I wish I had time to actually include this in the slide, but if you haven't read the book, Turn the Ship Around, um, I would highly recommend it. They talk a lot about this. I didn't realize I was doing something smart, so I was like, oh, cool. Someone else did this too and figured it out and did it better than me. But um, first thing we did uh, for behaviors was uh, the easy one, participate in developer rituals, right? Iteration planning meetings, stand-ups, things like that. Why? It puts the team, the ops team, front and center in their mind. Makes them realize like, oh, there's another part to this organization that I need to think about and consider. 
Start with yes, but. So operations folks have a long history of, you know, the bastard operator from hell, right? No, 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 no. And when someone comes to you and they say like, uh, hey, Jeff, can I get shell access to uh, production in order to restart a service? And I say no, well, conversation's over, right? Like, oh, good talk. <laughs> so what we said to the team, we said, let's start every, let's start the answer to every question with yes, but. And yes, but being, what are the things that we need to figure out or solve for to make that request plausible? Then it sort of resets your mind and how you're thinking about things. Now you're focused on solving the problem and the constraints that are forcing you, that would normally have prohibited this behavior, right? So, Jeff, can I get access to production to restart a service? Yes, but we have to figure out how we limit your access so that you can only restart that service. We have to figure out how we can ensure that you're restarting it during safe time periods. And we have to figure out how we can make sure that there's an audit log that you did that with appropriate approvals. Those are the only reasons why we won't let someone restart a service, right? Other than that, have at it. Who cares? So now that you've started it, yes, you're focused on solving the hurdles that are preventing you from actually implementing that. And sometimes you don't come up with an answer and you say, you know what, it's gonna be too much effort, we can't do it. But a lot of times, you can solve those things with just a little bit of energy. And just training your mind to think that way is extremely helpful. And then the third one was, can you give me some context? For a long time, ops was focused on Someone makes a request and we do it, right? But asking what someone is trying to accomplish is extremely powerful. If I come up to you and I say, hey man, can you give me a power drill? And you say, oh yeah, sure, and you just give me the power drill. You find out later that I was trying to open a jar of mayonnaise, right? You might offer a better solution than a power drill. You know, I say, well, you know, <laughs> there's these things called twist tops. It's amazing. So asking for context was a big thing that we did. And I'm actually gonna talk about this at an ignite a little bit later today. Um, but just being able to ask, what is it that you're actually trying to do? Because most people aren't coming to you with their actual problem. They're coming with their proposed solution to the problem they think they have. And you end up wasting a lot of time solving a problem that isn't really the problem. I just need to get the mayonnaise open. Metrics to track. So big thing for me is planned versus unplanned work. That's probably the most impactful thing that we could track because when I started, so this is metrics from like a week ago or two weeks ago. So 64% of our work was planned, 34% was unplanned. I don't know what happened to the other 2%. Uh, <laughs> figure that out later. Uh, when I started though, those numbers were reversed and actually slightly higher. It was more like 75% unplanned work. If your work is unplanned, are you actually working on things that are delivering value or are you fighting fires and just context switching constantly? So having an idea of how much time you're wasting on planned versus unplanned work is huge to know the types of problems that you're solving. And it's pretty straightforward. If you're using JIRA, we just use a label. Every week, I look at all the requests that were created that don't have a label for planned and unplanned, and I add it. I just look and I say, was this something that we consciously decided and put in the queue? Or is it something that popped into our queue and we had to deal with it immediately? So rolling into that, we then said, what are the recurring things that we're doing all the time? So as I looked at planned and unplanned work, I was like, man, there's a lot of people asking for console access. This is the current number. It was much higher previously. Uh, we said, why are people asking for console access so much? And there were a number of things. One, we weren't building tools that were really operationally supportable, right? So everything was, oh, yeah, and when we need to make this nasty raw SQL change, we'll just go on the console and execute it. No, maybe we should codify that in a script somehow. Or maybe we should create a tool that does this thing. Or if we're doing these things that are actually part of the business process, maybe we should create a UI for it and give it to someone that's not making $110,000 a, a, a year, right? Let's push that downstream because it's not really something that a developer needs to spend time on. So getting an idea of what's driving, con what's driving console access requests or whatever it is that's driving you crazy is extremely incredible for prioritizing your work because you can now say, well, how can I automate this so that I don't need to be involved with it anymore? And when you get planned work or when you get unplanned work down, you have a lot more time to do those things. And that's what we're constantly fighting now. What are the things that we're doing that we don't care to do? And how do we automate that? And now that we're not fighting fires and now that we're not doing unplanned interrupted work, we've got time to focus on those things. And guess what? We're all happier. We're doing cool stuff. 
we're working with Stackstorm, and you guys don't even know what that is. That's amazing. <laughs> so what do we talk about? Don't allow your ops department to be a nanny. Loosen the reins. Figure out what it is that's preventing you from giving people the access that they need to do their job. Because let's be clear, they're not going around installing Bitcoin miners. They're trying to do their job. You're right. <laughs> You're right. That was a bad example. You've definitely got a Bitcoiner in your organization. So once you get rid of that person, <laughs> then figure out uh, what it is that they're doing that's probably illegal. Um, <laughs> find ways to remove the nanny state but maintain operational safety. That's important, and it's not just for devs. It's important for ops folks too, right? Because ops people can make mistakes. So create tools that you are going to dog food in operations so that you know it's effective, so that you, you know that it's uh, usable, and most importantly, so that you know it's current, right? Because if you write something and never use it, the one time a dev actually needs it, it's going to be broken. Oh, sorry, that last Python 3 upgrade destroyed that library, and this thing doesn't work anymore. I did that. Um, monitor how your organizational language impacts behaviors. Think about the words that you use and what they mean. They're hidden meanings, right? Because they always, always, always impact behaviors. They impact your, your, the way you think about things and the way they, you tackle and shape problems. And then monitor and track uh, the type of work you're doing. Sounds trivial, sounds simple. So many people don't know what they're actually spending their time on. They complain about it but they don't actually know what it is and what's driving it. If you can have actual answers to that, everything becomes easier. You go into your boss's office and you say, listen, I need three weeks' time to be able to do X, Y, Z because this is generating work on a regular basis, and they're like, oh, wow. And most bosses are lazy, so they're like, I'm not going to dig into your data, so sure, yeah, take your, <laughs> take your two new hires, get out. <laughs> so make sure you know what it is that you're working on. And with that, that's all I've got. Hopefully I didn't go over. Perfect. Uh, feel free to reach out. Uh, I'll be around for the conference for the next couple of days. So uh, if you have any questions, feel free to uh, poke me and say hi. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs>